morning. It is wonderful to be here again this morning. It is a blessing that I can see all of you here in our auditorium. And for those who are in social media visiting us also, we just really happy that you came to visit us. I want to make just a little clarification here uh, before I begin this morning. Some of you may be rather new to the Source Church, and you've only been here for the last two or three weeks, and you came here because you heard that we had the most incredible, young, good-looking pastor who is the greatest preacher anywhere in the state of Florida. But you're sitting in your chair right now confused, because you're looking at me. I'm not him. But he will be back next week. He is a great preacher and a great teacher, but one of the things I'd love to do is to teach. And so he was kind enough to allow me to teach in the last three messages because that's where this series is going. But he'll be back next week and you'll be able to hear the greatness that I'm talking about now. And I'm not the only one who says that, so... It's a, it's a well-known topic, but this morning, I want to just again to, to encourage you to go to the 40 days of, of reading the Bible and to be able to take a look at what scriptures we have planned for you, to be able to see on this particular item of the different scriptures that you need to read. And what we want more than anything else, again, is to be able to build that great foundation of spirituality in your life. And one way of doing that is through reading the Bible. And so st- keep paying attention to this, work on this. We use the acronym of SOAP, which means that you have your scriptures, which we have on here, all the different scriptures. And then you have your observation where you are looking at what the details are in that particular passage. And then we have application where you actually go and live what it is that you read within that passage. And all of it is surrounded by prayer. So it's an acronym of SOAP, S-O-A-P. So stay with that and try to understand um, what these passages are trying to say to you. Also, the the preaching is going to be a little bit different through this series because we want to help you learn how to read the Bible and how to understand the Bible. So last week, I spent some time teaching everybody how to study the Bible and how to understand a passage. And this week is something close, but a little bit different. We're going to learn how to understand a text, just like one verse that may be in the Bible. And again, what we do here at the Source Church is a belief in expository preaching. And expository preaching is that you take a passage and you take a good look at that passage and you take other scriptures within the Bible that connect to that passage so you can really understand it. And if you really can understand it, then you know how it is that you're going to live that in your life. If you don't understand what you believe, then how is it that you're going to live it when you are living your normal life every day? And so we are really into expository preaching. But there's something else that we do once in a while because it's necessary, and it's called topical preaching. And that is when we want to talk about family values. We may pull out the Bible and find scripture verses in here that relate to family values. If we want to talk about marriage and we would go in here and find scripture that is related to marriage. But quite often what is the concern that uh, we have is that many pastors will take a verse and they'll twist that verse to make it sound exactly the way they want it to sound, to mean exactly what they want it to mean, and it really has nothing to do with what it is that they're preaching on. And then it just confuses everybody else within the congregation. Because if you take a look at a verse and you misunderstand what it means, it is going to hurt your faith because what you thought it said is not happening in your life. And so we're going to take a look at a little bit of that today, but what I would like to start out with is just just a few verses that people continually get wrong when they read the Bible. And the first one that I want to go to is Matthew 18, verse 20. Matthew 18, verse 20. And it states, 
For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I am among them. Again, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Man, that was so comforting when we first started the Source Church. When we had like seven people here. And rather than looking at the whole congregation, you would preach to the seven people that were here. And we would say that over and over and over, wherever two or more are gathered, and we felt so much better. But you know what? We do that in Bible studies. And we work hard and try to get people to come to our power groups. And when people come to our power groups and there's only two or three there, we again make that statement because it makes us feel good. But it has nothing to do with the verse. Totally wrong. We interpret it totally wrong. If you read the context, if you read before it, and understand what's going on, what it is talking about is discipline. If there is somebody who is sinning, and you want to go to their home, and you want to confront them in this sin, what they're saying is when two or more witnesses come together in the disciplinary process of a, of a brother or a sister, God will be with you. That's what it means. That's what it really means. And so we use it wrong constantly. The second one comes from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, and it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we see those on graduation cards where it's, it's, it's stating, well, you have now graduated, and because you have graduated, God is going to look kindly on you, and you are going to live the American dream, and money is going to come your way, and prestige, and power, and everything is going to be wonderful. And you know what? That has absolutely nothing to do with that particular verse. So what does it really mean? It's God talking to a nation, not to an individual, but it's God talking to a nation, and he's telling the Israelite nation who is in slavery in Babylon that there's still hope, that there's still plans for you. In other words, you are going to come back to Jerusalem, you're going to rebuild the temple, and you know what's going to come from you? That hope is Jesus Christ who will ultimately die on the cross for us. So how we use it? Always wrong. I never hear it in the right manner that it's supposed to be used, but that's another one. And the third one is judge not that you be not judged. Judge not that you be not judged. And what we do is we take that, and, and if somebody makes a comment about something that we're doing wrong in our life, you look at them and you say, you are not to judge me. Nobody judge me. Nobody tells me what I'm doing wrong. Only God can do that. That's what people use it for. But what does it really mean? It means if I'm going to come to you and I'm going to talk about a sin in your life, I better take a good look at my life. And I better find out what my life is like. I occasionally bring up things that have occurred earlier in my life because that was a long time ago. But I remember churches who would take a young lady who happened to be pregnant and not married. And they would ask her to come up in front of the church and apologize to the church for having sex without marriage. But who was doing most of the complaining? Those who had sex before marriage. And we knew it. And so if you're going to actually make any negative comments or try to encourage, I guess is a better word, those who are living a sinful life, then you better take a good look at yours. That's what it really means. Now, the number one verse. The number one verse, which I'm going to talk about today, that is used wrong over and over and over again, and we're going to take a good look at that, is, comes from Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. I can take a basketball and I can run towards the hoop and I can dunk it because God has given me that strength. Right? 
I can go to school and I can forget to study for my test, but who cares? Because I can do all things through God who strengthens me, right? I don't have to worry about my finances because God's going to make money come my way because I can do all things through God who strengthens me. And the list goes on and on and on. For those who love football, there's a guy by the name of Tim Tebow, and he is a quarterback in the NFL. And what does he have on his face quite often painted underneath his eyes? Philippians 4 verse 13. That is this particular verse. He can do all things through God who strengthens him. And so that must mean that he's going to win all those football games. But he loses a lot of them. So how does the verse work in that case? How does that verse work in that case? If you really want to dunk a basketball and you land on your back, but you thought God was going to give you all that strength to do it, then, then, then what's going on? So again, I say that if you misunderstand a verse, it is going to jeopardize your faith. If you misunderstand a verse, it's going to jeopardize your faith. So what I want to do this morning is I want to take that verse, that one verse, and I want to show you what it looks like in many different Bibles and what that verse actually looks like. The first one comes from the King James Version, and this is the one I learned as a child, and this is the one that is quoted most of the time, and it says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But then we have it out of the New International Version, and it says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Huh? What does that mean? I can do all this. All this what? What does that mean? I would have to dig in it to understand it, but people have a tendency to just bypass that this because they're comfortable with the other way in which it's said. And then there's the American Standard Version that says, I can do all things in him that strengtheneth me. And then we go down to a few other versions that says, I am able to do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me power. I have strength for all things in him that gives me power. And then the last one, listen to this one. I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. Huh? That really just ruined my verse. That maybe has a better explanation, but it just ruined my belief in what it was that I've been saying for the last 25 years of my life, that I can do all things in him that strengtheneth me. So we're going to take a look this morning, how to take a verse and how to take a close look at that verse. And I'm going to give you five steps in how to do that. But we're going to take a look at this individual verse. The first one is consider the historical content. So where is this verse located? It's located in Philippians. So if you investigate Philippians, you will find out that Philippi was one of the huge cities that existed during the time that Paul was doing his missionary journeys. It was huge. And it had main roads through it where a lot of commerce came through those roads. And that particular city was well involved in gold and the mining of gold and the buying and selling of gold. So this was a huge city. And what you learn that Paul does during his missionary journeys is he doesn't go to some backwater kind of village to go ahead and plant a church. He plants a church in a huge city, and he does that on a regular basis. So therefore, that information which he is giving to the people can be spread throughout the then known world due to the fact of all the people that are coming through the city. So he went to that city and he planted a church. And that is why a lot of that information about Jesus passed through that region. But Philippi was a very unique church and that there were very few, if any, Jewish people in it. And so therefore, when he wrote Philippians, he made no references to the Old Testament. And he didn't make any references to the Old Testament because there wasn't synagogues in that place. 
And there weren't Jewish people in that place. And usually when there's Jewish people, there's a synagogue. And since they know everything there is to know about the Old Testament, they want to hear what the Old Testament has to say in reference to what Paul is preaching. But in Philippians, you don't find any references to the Old Testament. So you know that he was speaking to the Gentiles at that point in time and that the Jewish people just weren't there. And so that helps us understand Paul as to what he's doing and where he's going. But in the beginning of Philippians, there's something very important, and I want to read that this morning. And it comes from Philippians 1, 13 through 14. Philippians 1, 13 through 14. And I have a terrible echo down here. But it's Philippians 1, 13 through 14. And it says... As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And so you're reading historical content here, and the beginning of Philippians, it actually is talking about how he is in prison. And when you see that, it starts helping you later on to understand this one verse. We want to go a little bit farther. We want to go to Acts 28, 14 through 16. Acts 28, 14 through 16, and then we're going to continue on through to Acts 30 through 31, verse 30 through 31. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome, and the brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Apias and the Three Taverns to meet us. And at the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. And when he got to Rome, now Paul went to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And so when he went to Rome, he was arrested by the Roman soldiers and he was put in prison, as you might say. And that is where the letters that he wrote came from. So what we are looking at Philippians is the letter to the Philippians church, which Paul wrote while he was in prison. And so most people, when they get an idea of a Roman prison, is under the impression that he was underneath some grade, water was pouring through, uh, it was extremely cold, life was miserable, and in some cases it were. But let's go down a little bit farther to verse 30, and it says, For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So he was in prison in Rome, but he was in a house and he was allowed uh, visitors and visitors came in and brought him things that he needed to, to uh, keep him alive But I'm also going to guess that they brought him things to write on. And those things are where he wrote his letters to the different churches. There's about four different letters that he wrote while he was in that prison that are books within our Bible. But you see what's going on with Paul. And you're seeing that his life isn't horrible, but he's still in prison. He's still not allowed to go where he wanted to go. In fact, he was in Caesarea before that. He was in prison for two years, and then they brought him to Rome, and he was in prison for two years in Rome before they finally let him go. But that is where the wonderful books in the Bible came from, uh, from that particular prison. So now we have this little bit of a historical sort of context as to what's going on in Paul's life. Let's go to the next one, and it says, consider the Bible context. Consider the the Bible context. Now, this is what I have often told you. When you have a verse, read what's before that verse and read what's after that verse. Read the chapter before that verse. Read the chapter after that verse. Read all around it because when you read all around it, it gives you the true meaning of that 
particular verse. So I'm, I'm going to go and read Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunities to show it. And so, in other words, the Philippian church often sent people and materials to Paul, but there was a period of time where they may not have known where he was, and they didn't know how to help him. But now they were able to renew that help because they know where he was. They sent their pastor to that prison to go ahead and give him what he needed, and he was thankful for what it was that they gave him. Continuing on. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Does that change the meaning of that verse a little bit? Let's, let's go to number three, the third way to take a look at this, and that is define the key words. Define the key words. So in this particular passage, what are the key words? And the key words are, it's in Philippians 4, verse 12, and it says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And so he found the secret of being content. So when you see this particular verse, I can do all this through him who gives me strength, all this is because he found the secret of being content. Now, look at Paul's life. We went through the historical part of it. He's in prison. If he can do all things through him who gives him strength, why is he in prison? Look at the life that Paul led. Paul was this wonderful Pharisee, this incredible attorney. He, he tried to kill Christians, and then he was converted. And what happened to after his conversion? He became the best apostle around but he suffered so much. He suffered being in jail on more than one occasion. He was whipped many, many different times. They threw rocks at him to try to kill him at a different time. He sat out in the sea because he was on three different shipwrecks. He was bitten by snakes. And the list goes on and on and on. He was a Pharisee at one point in time with a family who were all Pharisees. And then when he became a Christian, his family had nothing to do with him anymore. And he lost lost his family, and he lost his friends, and he lost everything. And if he can do anything in Christ who gives him strength, why would he go through something like that? So many of you, and for those who are listening on social media, are going through struggles in your life. Not just minor struggles, but severe struggles. You have marriage problems. You have finance problems. You're struggling with your kids, and these issues grow bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. You lost your job, or your job doesn't give you the same thrill anymore that it used to, and it's hard to get up in the morning and go to work and come back the next day and do the same thing over again. So there's issues after issues after issues. And what we don't want you to do is to understand this verse by saying, well, I am going to trust in God that he's going to take care of all of this stuff and it's all going to go away. It's not going to all go away according to this passage. What this passage means is God helps you find contentment in whatever it is that you're going through. And you're looking at me and saying, Pastor, you're absolutely insane. How could I be going through what I'm going through and find contentment? 
I wake up every morning and that particular problem is on my mind. All through the day, that problem is rolling through my brain. I'm exhausted at night as I fall asleep thinking about that particular problem. And I wake up the next day and I do it all over again. How in the world do I find contentment in a situation like that? Why? What does the verse say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Pray. Read the Bible. Talk to God constantly. Have conversations with him in your car. Have conversations with him at your home. And you don't always have to get on your knees. You can be anywhere and have that conversation with God. And when you know that he is with you and you really believe that he can give you that contentment, you will find that that contentment will come. And I've seen that in different people in this church where, where one person, in fact, had all kinds of things constantly going wrong in her life between her and her kids and whatever it might be. All kinds of things. I was just overwhelmed listening to everything. But she is the most content person, most calm person, Always have this wonderful smile on her face because she knows who God is. And so we have to take a look very closely at what the Bible passages around that verse actually say so we can get an understanding as to what it really means. Defining key words. That's the next one, is defining key words. And we did that, so we're now going to go to number four, which is interpret unclear verses. Interpret unclear verses. Now, how do we do that? Again, when you pick up your Bible, and it may be in the Bibles that we have here, but again, as I stated last week, you have to look for those little tiny letters in next to that verse to see if it gives you any other verses that you need to look at. Because the reason they do that is they want to give you clarification on that particular verse. So they will send you throughout the Bible to other verses that help you interpret the verse you're looking at. And so I want to go through those a minute with you to interpret unclear verses, which might be this one, with ones that are more clear. And so we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And it says... But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is Paul speaking again. Paul had an infliction of some type, but we don't know what it is. We don't know if it was mental. We don't know if it was physical. We have no idea what it is. But he prayed to God, please take it away from me. He did it about three different times. And what God said is, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Do you remember the different variations we had in the different Bibles? And some of the verses talked about power. That's where it comes from, that God gives us power to be content no matter what situation we might be under. The next one is Ephesians 3 verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the spirit in your inner being. And so again, it's all about when something is going wrong in your life and you don't know what to do it, God will give you the strength to survive. And my goodness, sometimes you don't believe it's going to happen. And you wonder how it is that you're going to survive through it. And in some cases, the thoughts come to people's mind that I may not want to live through it. That death would be a release from the pain that I'm suffering in this life. But remember, God's there beside you. And God wants you to feel that contentment. And he wants you to give you that strength. So remember you will make it through. It's always light on the other side of the whole event. And so you will make it through. God will be there. 
The next one is Colossians 1 verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Endurance. Endurance. You just got to survive through whatever it is you're going through. And God will give you that endurance and patience. Patience. That is one of the biggest things that we need to learn. Our society are not patient people. I find that when I drive here in South Florida, nobody's patient about anything. But we got to learn to be patient. Patience with our spouse, patient with our boss, patient with all the people that we work with. We've got to learn to be patient. The next one is from 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. And that's Timothy talking, that God has given him strength to endure the service in which he's going through, and that service is for Christ. For the setup and takedown crew, God is going to allow you to survive. You're going to make it. Uh, you're, it's, it's not going to be like this forever. But God wants you to be able to do what needs to be done in order to promote the service for him. And so all those who are involved in the source church in one way or another, look up 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. Take your wife's lipstick and write it on your mirror so you see it every morning when you get up. The last one is 2 Timothy 4 verse 17 and it says, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Again, you hear the word strength. So God's not going to give you what you want right now to take care of your issue, whatever it might be, but God's going to give you the strength you need to survive through it, and he is going to give you the contentment that you need in order to breathe as you go through that particular problem. The last point is look for an obvious meaning. I am somewhat of a simplistic person. And I don't want to take a verse and analyze it to the point where it no longer makes sense. You know, sometimes when you read the Bible and it says something, <laughs> that's exactly what it means. I know, I know sometimes when you hear us speak, we can take a verse and we can preach on it for eight weeks and come up with all kinds of stuff. But when you read that verse, sometimes the verse means exactly what it means. And I was thinking about that a little bit. So let me give you an example. Let's say a thousand years from now, a thousand years from now, and no longer the English language exists. It's a combination now of all the languages in the world all coming together and, and becoming one language. And there's archaeologists out there. And they go through some ruins and they come up with my cell phone. And they go through it. And they see on my cell phone me texting somebody and saying, well, Cindy's in Walgreens buying dark chocolate. So they look at this and they say, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate must be the sin in our lives. So Cindy must be involved in great sin in the darkness of dark chocolate. But we don't know who Walgreens is anymore a thousand years from now. But there's a wall in there. So Cindy, who is involved in this darkness, needs to climb over the wall to be able to get into the green pastures of eternity. Wall, greens. When all I was saying is that she's in wall, greens buying dark chocolate, like she always does. So you have to take something and, and accept it for what it's really saying and not glamorize it to such an extent that you no longer understand it. And so you can go and find commentaries that, that have all kinds of information about a small little verse telling you what you already knew by just reading the verse. 
So let's be careful a little bit that we don't go too overboard in some of the analysis that we do on these verses. And yes, I'm saying that to myself also. So understand it and understand for what it really means, but accept it for what it really says. Because again, I tell you that if you misunderstand a verse, it's going to damage your faith. And so if you take this particular verse and you think it's going to solve all your issues, then you're going to misunderstand it to the point that it's going to hurt your faith. But again, this morning we talked about this particular verse. And we can look at it and understand it in the whole bit, but I really want to talk about the thoughts behind this verse this morning. And simply speaking, how do you lose contentment? How do you lose contentment? Part of the Ten Commandments, you'll find something in there saying, I will not covet my neighbor's wife. I will not covet my neighbor's house, my manservant, maidservant, and so on and so forth. Covet is an interesting word because what we do when we covet is we take a look at what somebody else's has and wish we had it. I live in an apartment. I could look at somebody who lives in the house and say, "Guy, I really want to have a house. I really want to be able to live in a house. And I live in an apartment. And so what happens to my contentment about my apartment? Is it no longer there's any contentment? Because I want that house. And if, if I see somebody driving a cherry red Mercedes convertible, I might say, well, I'm no longer happy with my silver pickup truck. I would rather have that Corvette. And so there's no more contentment. And what do you get on TV all the time? If you sit in front of TV and you get commercial after commercial after commercial, and they tell you all the things that you need that you don't have, and then you're not happy until you have them. And so you live your life just not content in what you have and in who you are because you want what other people have. I made mention one time about a $700 pair of shoes that women might buy, and I found out afterwards that that's not so unusual. My life, that's really unusual, because I buy $35 pairs of shoes at Walmart. And so you might see a commercial of a woman where holding up these, I'm not going to say the word wrong, Leviton shoes for $700. And you're looking down at your feet and you see you're wearing sandals. And therefore your contentment just went out the window because you would love to have those shoes. And it goes for all these brand name clothes. I don't even know what brand names are. You can tell by the way I dress. But some of you might want to always do these brand names. And so therefore contentment isn't in your life. Because you always want what somebody else has. The second part to that is greed. You just want. And so what you do is you go to work every day and you make a certain amount of money at work. But there's this house that you want to buy. And you really want it to buy because it's going to make you look really good among your family and friends when they see you in this house. And so even though you can't quite afford that house, you go ahead and buy that house because you want that house. And you figure somehow, in some way, some money is going to come to you in the next year to help you pay for the payments on the house. And then that money doesn't come, and so you do the worst thing you possibly can do is you pull out your credit card, and you make a payment on your house on your credit card. And you know, with the interest rates on credit cards, they're going to eat you alive. But you don't have any money anywhere else, so you don't know how to do it, so you want to stall it for a little while, and you use your credit card, and then the next month you use your credit card, and pretty soon you're making house payments on a credit card, and your credit card is going way up, until pretty soon you have a $50,000 you know, bill on your credit card, and you're just paying the minimum payments. It will be a lifetime to be able to pay that off. But you have that house that you wanted. And then you want to buy that cherry red Corvette. And so you buy that because you want it and you can't afford it. But you go ahead and do the same thing with that. So as I stated before, you wake up in the morning and you groan because you, the weight of your finances are on your back. But you want it. You really want it. And you go to bed every night and you think, oh my goodness, I've got to pay these bills. 
but I've got the car. That's really cool. And then you dream at night that you found the gold at the end of the rainbow. And when you wake up in the morning, you're totally depressed because it isn't true. And it just hurts. And day after day after day, you go through the pain of trying to figure out how you're going to pay for everything that you want. Just a, a little finance thing is spend lower than what you make. Spend lower than what you make. Buy a house that is less than what you may be able to buy. So you don't have to live in that pain and concern and worry about your finances day after day after day. But it's greed. Greed that brings you that direction and takes your contentment away totally. And it's gone. But the last one is your faith that you have in God. That faith has to be strong. That faith has to be so strong that you're going to believe what he says in the Bible, as long as you read the Bible and know what he says, is that he will be at your side and he will give you that contentment that you need in order to survive. You need to have that faith and you need to understand what the Bible says so you know what it is that you need to believe. Contentment is a wonderful way to live. And if I look at all of you, there's probably hardly any of you who are content where you are right now. I could be wrong. Maybe there's a lot of you, and that'd be cool. But quite often, it's not that way. And trust me, I grew up that same way. I was never content. I always wanted more. I always wanted the better job. In fact, you would go for a job that made more money, that gave you more power, that you didn't like as much as the one that you already had. One of the jobs that I enjoyed the most was being a chaplain and being chaplain in a prison. And they barely pay you anything. But it was one of my greatest jobs that I had in my life because it felt like I was making a difference in some ways. But yet we don't do that growing up. We get those jobs that give us the most money so we can buy the most things and then we get the headaches from the finances. So the faith, strengthen your faith and understand what it is and how it is that God wants you to live. Shall we pray? Lord, it is so difficult to be able to be content with what we have and where we are in life. We always seem to want more, and quite often the reason that we want more is because we want to give a really incredible reflection of ourselves upon our friends and on our family. And they will think that we are more than what we really are. But quite often, Lord, we always hide this secret about how we can hardly keep together what it is that we have because we've pushed ourselves financially so far. So, Lord, help us to be able to back off the greed that exists in this world, to be able to ignore what other people have, and to be able to find contentment where we live, where we are, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.